Okay. I am the last talk. I am Philip Ballester. I have helped organize this with help from Joseph and John and others. <laughs> hey, Joseph. Um, I've been doing this stuff since circa 2006 or so. And over those uh, years, I mean, there's been a lot of uh, changes and things. And that sort of led to this talk, um, where we have an outline. So why is there a problem? And why do people spend so much time going on and on and on about layer setup tooling? Because in the good old days, there was only one directory. And it had all the recipes. And this was a very happy time because nobody argued about layer setup tooling. <laughs> and that was possibly the only thing we did not argue about. And collections, as Richard will remind you, is if you look at the layer tool, you know, how layers are done, you'll find there's a variable called collections. So you actually could have more than one repository in these days. So with one giant layer with all your recipes in it, you have a lot of problems. Um, you'll have inner recipe dependencies, so you have to have one version will map to another, and if you change one, you're forcing the change on the other, and you have people who disagree at exactly where you should be at some point in time, and it can be very difficult to have long-term stable stuff where you have these you know, dependencies. Um, we would also collect many versions of one package many times to support the fact that everything was in one and it was very difficult to break stuff out. And as people will say, this whole matrix was untestable. And in those days, we had a professional contingent and the hobbyist contingent, and on Friday, builds would be broken because the professionals went home for the weekend and the hobbyists would fix one thing and break another thing over the weekend. So it never worked. So you had one giant layer, and it became a big problem. But all you had to do was clone one repository. And if you were in monotone, that was another problem. Um, so in 2010, the Yocto project appears on the scene. And the big plus here is that meant a lot of dedicated engineers showed up that allowed us to address fundamental problems. So classic, open embedded classic, which you can view today on GitHub, that has a readme telling you not to use it. And the open embedded board at one point was requested to write an open letter that people could point their managers at is, please stop using this, it is unmaintained. Because it lived on many years after the arrival of open embedded core, which was a cut down set of layers, a cut down set of recipes designed to be consistent and testable. And a lot of stuff moved into meta OE at that point. So that's sort of the external stuff that is beyond the scope of test. I mean, you, ha you have to pick a testable target. And open embedded core is hard enough for people to keep up with. Meta OE and many other layers you still have the untestable problem, but at least we know what is good and what is maybe not quite as good. So Open Embedded Core is ex tested extensively on the Yocto Project Auto Builders. Um, and as I said, there's less testing the further you get from Core. So what is the problem? You now have projects that will take um, Open Embedded Core, Meta Open, meta open Embedded, uh, QT, Meta QT. For the examples I'll have here, there'll be Meta SDR and there'll be a board support package. So you've got five Git repositories you need to check out and understand their relationship and what you have. So you can get many, many permutations of branches and hashes in your build. And you need to keep track of that, otherwise you just won't be able to reproduce 
what you're sending to people. So what have we tried? We've tried a lot of things. Um, and it's not serial. These things have all been built up in parallel and get some modules has existed in parallel with these. So there's a thing called combo layer that creates the Pocky repo. And that, and Ross is gonna correct me when I get this wrong, is basically a tool that builds a new Git repository from a list of Git repositories with completely different hashes than are in OE core. And not being able to match hashes and history is a big problem if you're trying to develop against something because it makes going to your upstream a little bit more challenging. Yeah, yeah. Show me a developer who is going to take one more step than they absolutely positively have to. We have to copy and paste the git send email line out of the readme. Adding the hash to that, one step too many. So Google was fighting the same problem building Android. So as Google does, they invent a tool to solve this problem. And you would acquire repo by running wget against some address, and this tool would show up. And then you would write a file that in text that had paths and names and hashes in it. And this was a great leap forward and became very popular fairly early um, until people realized that you would run repo and it would update itself and then break the file format, um, which is pretty freaking annoying. Um, I think the people that are still using it have managed to edit repo so it doesn't do that to we them. Don't, we don't do that, but it, it, they haven't broken it in a long time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, so repo is really handy. So the guys at Siemens came up with something called CAS that I am not an expert on. Um, John Mason is an expert and has several talks that are recorded, I believe. Yeah, they're all recorded. Okay. You don't want to watch them, though. <laughs> that, yeah, that's fine. Don't, yeah, I can't watch myself. Um, so if you like repo, please use CAS. It's very similar with a bit more application specific to open embedded builds and is going to have much better behavior. OE setup layers has been contributed by Alexander Canavan. And what that will do, and correct me if I'm wrong because I haven't used it, you run it and it will basically give you a YAML? Was it YAML? Um, a file, there we go, <laughs> with the layer information to reproduce what you have in your build, uh, which is pretty handy. And there's a tool that will take this file with minimal dependencies, I think it's only Python, and then recreate your checkout. So that's pretty handy if you need to tell someone what you have. Um, and then my personal favorite is we did a survey, and a friend of mine added in the other print screen or cut and paste the BitBake banner and send it to the other guy and tell him that's your starting point. I already recorded it for the interwebs. Yeah. This has already been done and thought of. Yeah. I mean, it's great. Yeah, it works. Um, needless to say, you know, people have you know, a lot more expectations. It's really nice to be able to have good configuration control, um, especially as we become more professional and we actually care what we ship and we have S-bombs and we need to tie everything back. So we need to become all big and professional like GNU. <laughs> That's a story, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a line from uh, one of Linus's early emails. Um, so, you know, Git, of course, came from the great BitKeeper debacle and has been evolving over those many years, which I assume is about 15 at this point. Um, 
and it's designed to let you git manage other git repositories, branches, and hashes. So it gives you a way to have one git repository made of more than one. So you can fix the branches in each submodule, the hashes, and if you're careful, you can work upstream in your submodules. And by say careful, if you don't get it quite right, you may have to throw it away and start over. <laughs> but that's okay. It's okay because it's just a git checkout and you know what your state is. It also makes it very easy to pass around layer setups to other people. And with this, you will also get very good history of the evolution of your product and what you did. Um, it's not going to be as good as managing the conf parts of the build, so you have to be a little bit careful there. Um, so in this extremely small text that hopefully you can read, because I had to pick a font that fit, and yes, I use LaTeX to do slides. Um, <laughs> What you can see here is I basically make a new directory, CD to it, and get in it. Standard, make something new. And then what I do, because I don't check out Pocky, I check out the bits and pieces and I put them in a strange place for Bitbait that works, is I check out the 2.0 branch of Bitbake and the Kirkstone branches of Open Embedded Core, Meta Open Embedded, Meta QT5, Meta SDR, Meta TI, and Meta ARM. <laughs> and then I have to run, so this is one of these things that annoys people, is you have to run this thing called submodule update dash dash init. And that will magically actually get all the submodules and put code in the directories and set them to all the right hashes based on, okay, so it'll set the head of all the branches is what you'll end up with. And then I do a commit, and now I have a record of what I have. So now that I've built the layers, and I assume I did some testing before the commit, if I want to tell someone else to build what I built, I basically tell them to clone the submodule, the uh, the master project that I push to, and that does exist. It's basically I have an SDR build directory with like many branches and combinations of key mu, master, various branches, many abandoned as they got old. And I do the infamous git submodule minus minus init, get used to typing this, because it will basically if you start messing around in the submodules, this a lot of times will get you back to your, your commit that you have in your master repository. Run the ubiquitous template conf pointed at some setup files that I keep in meta SDR. Export machine Beagle X15 because I was working on another machine when I committed. Bitbait GNU Radio demo image and a few hours later you'll have the demo that I was running on the table at Fosdem. So if you want that image for Beagle X15, that's how to do it. Um, which is not the one or two lines with CAS. It's a few more lines, but it's pretty darn close. Um, so now I've been sitting around for a while, and people have pushed stuff to Kirkstone and things. What I can do is git submodule update minus minus remote, and that will basically move all the branches to the head. So it'll basically suck in all the updates. And bit bacon or demo image. Wait, depending on what changed, you know, 20, 30 minutes to a few days, well, hours. Okay, and I told you I was going to kind of ramble at the end. The other thing is I talked about working upstream, and this is the big thing for me, is I have my development thing, and basically it's checked out detached heads in the submodules. But what you can do is, with a little bit of thinking and typing git log, you can see what branch you're on, just check out the branch. So you, have, you now have an active branch, and you, know, you can pull against it, 
you could make a new branch, and this is where it's going to get weedy, because you can do dumb things now. Um, you can like fix, you know, check out fix this, fix your build, send it upstream, and wait for it to come out the other end, and change back to the main or a price submodule in it, and then get pull and have your fix flow back into your build. So you can be there, you can keep temporary fixes in branches, you just have to be careful pulling if you get in that situation. Okay, <laughs> this is not designed to be comprehensive. <laughs> I am describing my workflow and what works for me. Um, and I've had pretty darn good luck with it. And I'm um, so how do you get around the problem where you change, uh, let's call it a child, in your Git repo, and you forget about it, and then you reset, and, and it's lost forever? Um, is it lost forever, or does it? Um, At least it will be in your um, ref log. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you, if you commit against the floating head, the detached head, it'll tell you to change branch. It'll tell you to create a branch. I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm just saying it, every now and then you can get, I mean, if you start trying to change branches and it, in the older days before they improved some of their branch handling stuff, you would edit the .git modules file and that was almost always the path to tears. Yeah, don't ever Yeah, I mean, I have. Um, but it is the path to tears. Um, but what I'll say is over the, you know, git, Submodules has added options and gotten better behaved over the years. I mean, when I first started using them, I couldn't figure out how to use it. Um, and it took a lot of pain and agony to get there, and that's why I just wanted to put down some lines and clone mine and build it. Um, so the other thing that is you have to... Just interrupt him. Just interrupt him. Okay. Uh, so in your example of uh, how you um, pull your layer or clone it, you can also use uh, clone minus minus, minus recursive. recursive. Yeah. yeah. Get rid of one of the load lines. Yeah. I so I just don't trust commands that do too many things. <laughs> <laughs> like the <big> bag. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I am old, I've trained my fingers to do things particular ways, and then you have these more modern ways of doing it. Y you're right. And there's also a pull recursive. Yes. So if I know yes. you're using this model, I can just pull yes. from you with yes. recursive and get the same yes. uh, states of my subjects. Yeah, I, there are a lot of options. Read the man pages. You will become intimate with the Git manual if you do this. I, and another thing we've been doing for our customers is uh, add uh, OE in a, uh, in a build and wrapper script into the master Git repository. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, that's another really so good trick. So it just behaves like a pocket checkout. Ooh, very clever. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, obviously, once you start doing this, there's a lot of stuff you can do. I'm a Git submodule user. No. Um, <laughs> uh, my favorite part is that your grep tools don't ignore all your submodules. <laughs> so you can actually find things in them, because otherwise you have to git ignore all your places you've checked stuff out. So that's yeah. always my pet peeve when I use things that don't use submodules. It is. Yeah. yeah. Like, because all, all the tools that, and you know, if there's git ignores in your submodules, those are properly ignored. The submodules themselves are not ignored. So yeah. does anyone fix dev tool to work with git submodules very well? Ooh, this is on my list of things to do. Yeah. I think I actually have a bug now. Not that it's a reoccurring problem, but it's meta on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my favorite mistake is to update a submodule and then add the hash change in the upper layer, push it, and my build bot goes off to build it, and I forgot to push the lower level layer. <laughs> Um, that, that, that you will be notified. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it takes a while to train your fingers not to make mistakes. It is not foolproof, but 
it is very good at keeping very accurate information about the state of your build without you cutting and pasting hashes into cache fo files. I have the number of times I cut the extra I into a repo file because I use VI and I would hit I when it was already inserting. Um, That's ready to use Emacs. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done! Real VI users have a colon Q sprinkled over the Emacs. <laughs> okay. Do you have a question? Uh, just uh, a note. Uh, one thing that I found quite useful when you, uh, working with submodules is that you can uh, configure Git to show also the diff of the submodules in the yes. main Git. So there are one or two config options so that it's uh, normally when you open a Git view shows what has changed between the commits in the submodules with a short history. Oh, okay. I'll have to look for that one. I, I sh this, this talk is actually on Git, and I will take pull requests. <laughs> <laughs> no, hopefully by mail. Snail mail. No, I, I'll just take pull requests for this one. Another thing I find useful, uh, in some projects we keep the project-specific metadata layers in the top-level repository as well. So then you can have the opportunity to make changes to the recipes and the layers in the same commit. So you, for example, you can say, I update OE core to a new version, and to make an according change in my local BB appends, make that in the same commit, and the history is totally clean and understandable. The whole package. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else have horror stories? Ah. Oh, many, many horror stories, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I like that because one of the, the many mistakes I make, and quite recently um, I was using somebody's build tooling, and I'd just branched off a load of um, layers, and it would all work fine, you know, and I'd left it for a bit and come around to it again. It failed because underneath me, the meta flutter, for example, had been updated, but I was on the branch, not the commit because I hadn't thought that through properly. Whereas with what you're doing with the submodules, it locks it at those checkouts, doesn't it, until you make the choice to Yeah, you make the choice to, to move head, the which, pointers. Which is nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And you can, you can bring it forward, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm, uh, I'm one of those many lazy developers, and I love going on to, you know, someone like GitHub, where I can see that it, what it's locked into in, in those submodules. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the, the big things I have when I'm trying to do handover with people is I invariably, I've got all these layers, I've got the layer definitions, I've got all this stuff, but I've got a local .conf and a BB layers somewhere. And I would like to just wrap it up and give that to them. Yeah. And I kind of end up with a repo with that stuff in that kind of vaguely points at all the other stuff. And I'm wondering what best practice is for that. So. Yeah. <laughs> because local means local. So the other thing I'd say is you noted how I had my own conf directory. So I tend to wrap, like especially for getting BB layers and local.confs with tweaks in it, I tend to keep them in there. Um, I mean, it would be really nice to have a tool to create cast files from something like this, um, which OE setup layers is basically doing, except it's not called cast files. Uh, I don't know how configuration is handled with OE setup layers. Um, I mean, the good news is I think we're starting to converge on tools, but it's going to take time, and getting it perfect is going to be very hard. Yes? One more question. Please don't throw beer at me, but why don't check in in that setup the bblayers conf and the local conf? I mean, in bblayers, you can have... A Relative pass <laughs> in, <laughs> yeah. Still, relative means that the pass structure has to be similar. Well, this it's locked down. Yeah, it's lo totally locked down. You check out and then yeah. you have the exam. So the headache, the yeah, but, but what in local dot com you have your deal. Uh, stop, stop. First, we're talking about layer. BB yeah, layers. 
Okay, um, so why don't check in BB layers? So what happens to me is I have BB layers set up in a conf file. When I run OE setup in it, it ends up with full paths in it. So yeah, I that's what I'm just talking. That's what I yeah. always change manually to the top to tier the and the dot dot slash to have it relative. So, okay, okay. I we mean, can check in that. What yeah. about local conf? Joseph? <laughs> There, don't check it all. Don't, don't check in local.conf because it tells you things about your local machine. Yeah. Where your DLDR is. Yeah. How many threads you have occasionally. No, no, yes. it's not there. It's automatically adjusted. The machine can be. Uh, nope. uh, yeah, some people. There's a lot. It does not work. There's a lot of var variants of what people yeah. put in conf files. Um, one thing why it, the relative stuff does not work for. Or, as a historical reason in uh, BB layers, I might be mistaken and or drunk. Um, <laughs> but as far as I know, the ability to um, write relative paths in BB layers to count is only there since like six or seven years. So, so there are people <laughs> in here who have been using BB layers many years more. So, so nowadays you can do it, okay? <laughs> so let's talk about local comp. In, lo, lo, I mean, I might try to do this now. Don't provide yeah. a local comp for you. Yeah. Like, like, you can provide a template, but don't make them use a specific local comp because it is local. It is their configuration. It is not yeah, but yeah. it's not specific to your machine. Oh. It's specific, it is to, the specific to, it's to, it's specific to the person who is sitting in the seat doing the build. I, I'm going to say that there are there's a lack of structure where different people put different things in local.conf, and I have made the mistake of putting stuff in local.conf I shouldn't have. So, so the way we solve that is we build everything in a multi config mm -hmm. and all of our, because what this allows us to, what, what, what you want is you want someone to sit down and say, I can build this product, right? Mm -hmm. I want to build this product. I don't care about my local conf, I just want to build this product. I want to use my SHR and DLDR, sorry. DLDR. So one, one way you can do that is CAS. Another way you can do that is we use multi-config. So I should put all of the, this is the thing that makes this thing, this product, in the multi-config. Mm -hmm. And then the user sits down, they have their local comp, works just fine. They say bit bake, MC, product, foo, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And that builds that product. Mm -hmm. But they can still, they can override whatever they want in their local comp, but most of the time it's just SD. I mean, Put it in some auto conf or whatever. Yeah, you can do auto conf too, but so it's the same story. I mean, I'm just talking about a simple yeah. use case where uh, you have some example you okay. want to ship, ship to somebody. But, but the good news is we're now talking about one file. Yes. Yes. We, we've improved. Yes. And there should be nothing in local conf to check in. It's yeah. all being distro. Yes. Yeah, but what if we're lazy and don't have a distro conf file? So, which is what I do. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You know, we wouldn't do that, of course. You know, it would be stupid, wouldn't it? <laughs> but, but, but um, I have I have worked with numbers of teams who have not gone down the route of having a look at what a distro is about and so on and so forth, and just banged it all in local conf. And then I've kind of come in, and you you go through that phase, don't you? Of kind of go, what is going on here? You know, how how is this functioning? And you're missing bits because they've sort of got lost. And I, I don't know what the answer to that is, but, but a part of me sort of says, it'd be great if you weren't allowed to do this stuff in local conf, and then they couldn't append oh. images. <laughs> and, and, and it was only local. There is a Linus quote on that, when he talked about SVN, and he said, like, well, if it works for you, you're free to do it, but then you're ugly and stupid. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So speaking as someone who has to support customer BSPs, there's no way that we could put stuff into local.conf, right? Because we have custom estate hash servers, we have an ICC cluster which may not be available at the customer, and so we only provide a localconf.sample which sets some default values and then you're free to adjust localconf as you see fit for your local build environment. And that's what, it, what it's meant to do, right? Same for yeah. layers. So we also provide a VB layers sample um, in the project uh, meta layer then that you can use to set up. Yeah. Another way I've seen that done that's a little uh, easier barrier to entry, um, aside from cause obviously, is uh, if 
you, you make a file that describes the product. Mm -hmm. And the thing you do to build that product is you add the one require that file in your local conf. And that's, that's how you select your product. And, that, that, and then you can check that file into Git. Because the problem you have with the templates is mm -hmm. the next time, like if you change something in the template, no one gets it. <laughs> <laughs> right, because yeah. they don't they don't delete their local conf and rebuild the template. <laughs> right, yeah. no one does that. No one wants to. So, uh, the the way that you can do that that's really like a you know like a step in the right direction is to just check a file in that's your product configuration. Say you require this file to build this product in your local conf. You build that works pretty well. They get the changes automatically when they pull up. Works works well. That's a neat trick. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I normally do is also um, just write machine and distro to the start of the bit bake command. And if you don't have to change layers, okay, if you have to add layers, but yeah, we know ideal layers can be added without changing the build, yeah. um, then you can just configure with these two variables everything that is necessary. And uh, I have some uh, site configuration file where is everything configured that is specific to my build environment, and uh, then they just really pieces where I'm working on trying things out that actually land in local conf. We do that, sorry, we do that same trick with sites, with the require thing. So like, you know, we have people spread all over the world that have different setups. So like, you know, in Kansas, my estate server is an NFS drive somewhere, right? But in mm -hmm. Germany, it's not, mm -hmm. right? It's a different one. So we have pre-canned site.conf that they just require in. Yeah. And that works really well. And that's site.conf, not local.conf. <laughs> and it's All automatically right. parsed, like yeah, auto.conf. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions, or can we terminate this talk and then talk amongst ourselves? 